Welcome to The Breakpoint with Paul Irish and Adi Azmani. Today, we're going to show you some cool stuff inside the DevTools, uh, tell you a little bit about hardware acceleration, and hopefully teach you about some uh, JavaScript language tooling that should really help your kind of team productivity and ability to maintain large projects. Uh, so first off, we're going to kick off immediately with a demo. Um, and if we go to my screen, I'm going to show Wikipedia here. So we have just a standard, this is the, the Wikipedia page for Wikipedia. Um, now, what I want to do is I want to look at uh, how it loads. Uh, some people on, on the Chrome team were actually looking at this um, on the Nexus 7 tablet. And uh, it has a little bit of a weight uh, as the page is loading. So if, actually, if I just load the page, uh, I'll get rid of the dev tools for now. And I'm moving my, my hands on the trackpad to scroll it a bunch. Um, you can see it's, okay, I, I kind of missed my target. But there is a good three, mil, three second delay um, as the page is loading before it starts getting responsive. Uh, you can test this out yourself right now. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to show that in the DevTools timeline. So let's hit record. And now I'm going to go back and refresh the page. And we're waiting for the spike. There it is. <clears throat> All right, so right here, this big yellow spike. So yellow is JavaScript inside the, the timeline here. And if I scroll down a bit, uh, if there's too much blue for you, you can always just uncheck the uh, blue on the very, very bottom down here. Uh, I'll do that for now. Uh, and you see this guy here. So this is a, a three and a half second frame. Three and a half seconds where the browser's not responsive to the user at all. Um, so this is pretty interesting. So we have these three big yellow blocks where we're, it looks like we're evaluating the script over here. Uh, let's open them up. And looks interesting. So we have kind of this waterfall look uh, where there's a few things going on. And if we look over on the right-hand side, it looks like a lot of recalculate style, recalculate style. Here we have recalculate style going back and forth with layout. So this is a, um, uh, this is a situation called layout thrashing. But for right now, um, let's focus on this layout style. Um, sorry, recalculate style. So the fact that it's doing the same thing over and over again is usually an indication to you that something might be wrong. Uh, and we can find out what's going on here. So if we just hover in this area, we get the tooltip, and we get the actual call stack on why we're uh, recalculating style. First, our layouts were invalidated at some point during the add embedded CSS. And then our uh, recalc was forced again in add embedded CSS. Hmm, OK, interesting. So if I click through, um, well, it's all minified, but we can address that. So I'm going to click the pretty print button on the very bottom. Uh, we pretty print. And just to make sure that we're looking at the right spot, we're going to go back to timeline and click through again. Uh, and here we go. So we're looking at add embedded CSS right here. And it jumped me to this line, actually. So what add embedded CSS is doing um, is uh, Wikipedia loads a bunch of its modules um, into the page kind of lazily as the page is loading. And then um, if there's any styles associated with it. So they actually have like a little tooltip module, and they load in jQuery UI for a widget farther down the page. Um, and then CSS needs to go into the page. And in order to deal with a IE bug um, where you could only have up to, I think, 32 style sheets per page, they reuse an existing style element. So it's an inline style element, and they just append more content into the bottom of it, um, which makes sense if you only have a maximum of, of 32 possible style sheets uh, available to you. But it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, otherwise. So, um, so here we have basically, there's a few techniques for, for adding in new styles. One is using stylesheet.css text, which is only supported, I think, by IE, but that might have changed. Um, and otherwise, we create a little text node, and we just inject it into a style element. Basically the same thing. But what these two techniques do is it just says to the browser, hey, you know all those styles that you were keeping track of, and you, you knew the computed style of the of all the elements on the page? Throw all that out, um, because I just changed the world, and you're going to have to recalculate everything else. 
And so this, uh, if we look at the timeline, happens about 20 times or so as the page is loading. Um, and so the browser is just doing all this work again and again and again, doing the same recalculation of style with a very small little difference at the end. Um, and it turns out WebKit, actually, we were digging into this and in we looked through the source of WebKit. Uh, WebKit actually has a fast path for if you're just adding a few new uh, extra styles um, at the end of the document. And it doesn't have to recalculate the world. It can just kind of augment what it knows with the new styles, and it's fast. But here, we're clearly not hitting this fast path because every single recalc is taking, wow, uh, 137. 130 milliseconds. Um, that's when a frame is 16.6 .6 milliseconds. 130 milliseconds is a long, long time. So, um, so this is a, a bit of a problem. Uh, but luckily, we've gotten in touch with some of the developers at Wikipedia uh, and Wikimedia to address this, and we've uh, fixed it in two places. So one is this recalculation of style. Like I said, these come in from modules. Um, and so one of the approaches that we did is uh, we just batch it all together, right? We have new styles coming in from seven different places. Um, let's just smush them all together into one string and inject it at, at, uh, once. And so that, we can basically take these 20 uh, recalculation of styles and bring it down to about five or so. Um, so that's a really big win. The second is we're not going to continue to augment an existing uh, style tag. Instead, we're going to create new ones, um, except in the case of IE, um, IE 6 through 9, where that style sheet limit is still enforced, and we'll still continue to do this little trick. Um, lastly, I wanted to show this kind of layout thrashing. So what we can see actually on um, a hover of the layout where we have this little, uh, the little icon. So the icon is there because a forced synchronous layout is a possible performance bottleneck. Um, and so what this means is that, so we see that the layout was invalidated because we added new stuff. Um, but the layout was forced here. Basically, browser needs to deliver what the geometry of the page is to, uh, to where we are in this Cur CSS. So this is actually inside of jQuery. Um, so if we look down, it looks like our loader that is bringing in these modules is doing some stuff. Um, it's now injecting some styles into the page. Uh, and now we're going through jQuery. And it looks like we have to uh, augment with their height. And if I click in this Curse CSS, uh, yes, I just used get computed style. Um, and we're about to figure out what the style is of something. So apparently, uh, right inside here, we have to do um, something. It looks like we're setting uh, the width of the page or the height um, of an element. Um, and in order to do that in jQuery, it needs to use get computed style. So basically, uh, the browser says, stop everything. Let me get this value. OK, here you go. And then immediately after that, we're going to recalculate all the styles again and again and again. So there's a few ways to, to address this. Um, in this case, you can get all your truth out of the DOM. Say, you need to get, get computed style. You need to get an offset top, et cetera. Do those all together, and then make changes uh, to what the styles of the page should be. Um, that's probably the best way to handle this. Um, when you see a pattern going back and forth like this, uh, you know that it could be better. So anyways, the good news here is, um, Every page on Wikipedia was slow before. Um, and the fix actually should be rolling out within a week or so. Um, and so you should be seeing a benefit and be able to scroll immediately on uh, both desktop and on tablet um, immediately upon loading the page, which I'm really excited about. Um, so Addy, how's it going? Really awesome. So I'm going to be talking about GPU acceleration. Now, traditionally, browsers have relied quite heavily on the CPU for rendering pages. And it's only in the last few years that we've realized that involving the GPU in compositing those pages can yield us some really nice performance benefits. In Chrome, we've actually for a while now had this concept of a composite layer for minimizing repaints and basically using GPU acceleration. And the idea is if you're using something like you know, Translate 3D with a WebKit transform, that'll get promoted to a composite layer before it gets animated. Now, 
GPU acceleration of your DOM elements has a number of different benefits. Um, it's a little bit more efficient to draw things to the screen, and you avoid issues like copying over really large amounts of data from the video to system memory. So I'm actually going to show you an example of a site that's taking advantage of GPU acceleration. And it's this nice demo by David DeSandro called Undulate. So the idea is I move my cursor around. I get this really nice fluid animation. Um, if you open up your DevTools and you go to Settings, there's actually a really nice feature that gives you insights into what DOM elements are being manipulated at a GPU level called Show Composited Layer Borders under Rendering. So I go and I enable Show Composited Layer Borders. And what you can now see is around each of the circles on screen, there's a little golden border indicating that that element is being manipulated at a GPU level or that it's using hardware compositing. Now that's really awesome. Um, just to confirm again, remember I was talking about Translate 3D um, with the WebKit Transform earlier, and that's basically what they're using here. So I've just shown you Undulate, and the next example I'm going to show you is Isotope, which is another plugin by David DeSandro. Now, um, if I go into my DevTools and I enable uh, Show Composite Layer Borders once again, what you'll notice is that all of these elements, they're taking advantage of GPU acceleration, every single one of these. And that's helping in this case. These are, this is actually using, um, once again, WebKit Transform with Translate 3D, and it's doing it properly. Um, another thing you may have come across over the past few years is something called the Null Transform Hack. Now, the Null Transform Hack basically allows you to force GPU acceleration of a DOM element, meaning it's going to get promoted to its own composite layer. Now, a few years ago, this hack was a lot more relevant. It basically gave you some great mileage in your page whenever you found that it was, you know, it was slow, um, and it 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 played, you know, played its part. But Chrome has been getting much better um, at handling compositing in the background for you, so that you don't have to use hacks like these. However, there are going to be cases where you might get a little bit of mileage out of it. Be careful when you're using it. The um, only case where I suggest, you know, actually using Translate Z is where you have a measurably high paint cost on a DOM element. So if you have a measurably high paint cost, you've used Timeline, you've used our other tools to figure out if there's a high paint cost on a DOM element, then maybe try out the Translate Z hack and see if you can get some mileage from it. One other demo that took advantage of the Translate Z hack is Google Space by Mr. Dube. Now, um, what he found was that you know he was animating this stuff in his page and it was just going really, really slow. He wasn't really sure why, um, and he took advantage of the of the null transform hack. And, and basically, um, I've got composite layer borders on at the moment, and look at what happens. It's now animating a little bit more smoothly. Um, you can see the composite layer borders around each of our elements, and you know it's it's a little bit more smooth. It's a little bit more buttery, and that that looks good. You have to be really, really careful um, when you're using the, the null transform hack, however, because if you go and you apply it to every single element in your page, you're basically going to offload a whole lot to the GPU. You have a limited amount of VRAM um, on desktop, on mobile, and you just want to make sure that you're not bursting that. It's less, it's less likely that that's going to happen on desktop, a lot more on mobile. Um, and I'm actually going to show you. Uh, so. The Guardian is a website that uh, that performs sort of okay. So this is like a, a newspaper in, in the UK, and, and this site performs sort of okay on desktop. Um, if I go um, back into sort of my dev tools, I've got show composite layer borders on, um, and I go and I add basically a null transform to everything on the page. So WebKit transform uh, translate Z zero. What you'll now see is that there is a composite layer border being drawn around everything because it's all being promoted. And this page is actually going to run a little bit more slowly than it was before because absolutely everything is being offloaded to the GPU. That's not a good thing. Now let's take a look at what this does on mobile. So I've got my Android phone with me. I've got um, Chrome beta currently running. So this is the experience. So let me, let me show you what I've got. Uh, this is what the experience looks like um, without me enabling uh, the null transform hack on absolutely every element on this page. So I'm scrolling through. Their mobile experience is actually pretty decent. You see, I'm able to scroll through the entire page, and it's, it's not too bad, to be honest. Let's go in and let's see what happens if I actually enable this hack. So WebKit transform translate Z0. And now, now watch. It actually takes a while to scroll. I know it's, it's again subtle, but it's actually taking a while to scroll through this page. It is not as smooth as it was before. 
And so you need to be very careful whenever you're using the Translate Z hack. Um, you don't want to blow your VRAM. You don't want to put too much pressure on your GPU. Now, um, for people that are wondering, you know, why isn't Chrome trying to do more of this stuff automatically for me? Why are people still needing to use these Translate Z hacks? So if you go to Chrome Flags, you can actually take a look at some of the work we've been doing um, to further compositing. And there are actually two experiments in particular that you can, you can go and you can play with. Um, you can enable GPU compositing on basically all of the pages that you browse on. And you can actually also enable threaded compositing, um, which gives you an additional thread uh, for web page compositing. And it just gives you things like smooth scrolling, um, even when the main thread, which is where a lot of the action happens, um, is unresponsive. So go and play with those things. We're currently still benchmarking the performance of compositing across all pages. But in most cases, it's actually going to perform pretty well, um, at least as good as you know, using the Translate Z hack across all the elements on your page. So the takeaway from this is uh, be very careful when you're using null transform hacks in your pages. Uh, make sure that if you're applying them, that you're, you have a measurably high paint cost on those DOM elements where you are applying them. And, and just be careful when you're using these things. Make sure to measure. Measurement is the most important thing when you're doing any sort of performance optimization on your pages. So yeah, that's, that's it for me. I was just going to add on a few things to that. There's been a few updates in kind of uh, the compositing uh, situation in Chrome. Um, so for any um, composited layers, uh, you now get, if you've taken like a, like a div before and rotated it 45 degrees and you had text inside there, you might have noticed that the text quality is not so sharp. Um, so it'll now look great as long as that div has a background. Uh, so that's a somewhat recent change, probably about two weeks ago or so. Um, so it's opaque composited layers get anti-aliasing. Uh, the other is that uh, fixed position layers um, are now composited for you automatically um, in a few situations. One, if you're on Android, um, then it's done for you. Um, on desktop right now, um, it's in many cases, uh, you may have to use something like the null transform if it's a situation where it really has benefit. Um, in high DPI situations, uh, so you're on a Retina machine or on other, another laptop with a really high uh, resolution, a Chromebook Pixel even, um, those fixed any fixed position layers are now composited as well. Um, so you're going to see the same kind of performance increase. Uh, so it's a really good thing, and this will be coming to uh, situations where it's in, where it's not high DPI uh, very soon. Once we can get uh, anti-aliasing, text anti-aliasing um, on these layers as well. So uh, kind of there's a few. We want to make sure the type looks good before we, we flip the switch um, and give the compositing performance boost to everyone. So that's kind of the, the update. Uh, lots of things have been changing in this area recently. So there we go. Um, lastly, I wanted to show just a few um, Slides, and this is uh, some great stuff um, that uh, a lot of this comes from uh, work and research done by Arya Hidayat. And Arya um, created Esprima, also created PhantomJS. He's a platform architect over at Sencha. Um, but there's a, a lot of great uh, tools now available for JavaScript language uh, authoring, editing, debugging, continuous integration. And I wanted to show a few of them. And the first thing that I want to say is that all your, a lot of teams set up style, style guides, uh, especially for JavaScript. And I think this is a great thing. And I think that things like JS Hint have really allowed us to have maintainable rules that we can kind of agree on and, and say, for this project, this makes sense. Um, and so the most important thing, I think, is that every code style, you, code style rule that you have uh, it should be backed by tooling, so you should not be able to. You should not say something about your use of commas or spaces around assignments that you cannot enforce with tooling, because it's a waste of our time, like humans' time, to be worrying about style inside our JavaScript. Um, and I see this in open source or pull requests, and people will be like, the, like the first comments will be like, yeah, well, you know, puts more white space here, and it's, it's not a good use of our time. Um, so. I'm going to show a few of the tooling, a uh, few pieces of tooling that exist for this sort of thing, um, and other pieces of uh, JavaScript authoring. All right. First, uh, a little bit ago, um, I think back when I was in London, 
Addy and, and, and I, and we had on Cinder Soros, and he talked a little bit about a few of the project level um, collaboration techniques. So one is setting up a git attributes file where you specify star text equals auto. Make sure that your line endings are good. Do it. It's great. Um, editor config has gotten a new enhancement since we talked about it last. So it used to only um, define uh, how end of lines are uh, done um, indent style. It now covers things like a uh, extra line at the end of the file. A few other things. Um, they're all really good. The kinds of defaults that you go up into your into your editor to make sure that you you apply no extra no trailing white space, things like that. Um, so that's great for all all code, not just JavaScript, um, and really makes uh, just collaboration easier. Projects can be or rules can be set per project. Um, JS hint, which I just mentioned. And a JS hint RC file, you can define your rules for the project. And every uh, Sublime text and, and the Vim plugins um, all honor this file. Um, Grunt as well honors this file if it's placed in the root of your uh, project. So that um, even if a project differs from another one, um, you can define what your JS hint settings are. Um, and everyone that's collaborating there will honor them. It's really good. So a few more things uh, that are available for JavaScript language tooling. Um, so this is a, a use of a pre-commit hook um, inside Git that will validate that your code is syntactically correct. So we're using a binary called esValidate. It uses Esprima. It's a node binary. Um, and basically, this just makes sure that you cannot commit uh, to Git unless esValidate passes it. So this is not a linter. This is just a validator. Um, so it's a... Uh, it's just like everything is syntactically correct. It matches ECMAScript uh, standards. Um, Plato is a f fantastic project. So this is a visualization of Plato uh, data, um, but it exists as a node binary as well. Um, gives some ideas around a maintainability index, um, an estimated number of bugs, which is a kind of controversial idea. But um, it has a lot to do with the cyclomatic complexity, whatever that means, of uh, code. Uh, lint errors, and so you can kind of get a sense for um, one of the things I think is, is really interesting is taking something like the maintainability index and charting that over time and kind of a continuous integration thing. So being able to see that over the life of a project and to know that you know when some big new feature landed in, the code um, inside the project uh, got significantly more complex and hard to maintain. I think that's a fantastic thing to kind of visualize for the team. Uh, this is a Boolean trap finder. So Boolean traps is an um, is API design flaw where uh, you use a Boolean in your API to define that. Uh, so in this top one, this is a, this is a real, uh, real world example. New slider false actually means that it should be a vertical slider and not a horizontal slider. Bad API design. Um, this could be much better. You pass in an object that says, you know, vertical equals true, um, and we can just detect all these across the project um, and make sure that we aren't doing something like this. Um, so this is uh, so polluting variables. So if we have a variable that we don't define and it leaks to global, we should be notified immediately. JS hint does um, captures mu much of this, um, but using in this case Node leaky does this by using a Sprema as well. Um, always smart to check. I've seen a few projects that have changed their style guide and said, you know, we were all double quotes and now we're switching to all single quotes. And it's a little bit hard to search and replace for, um, but tooling can actually just tackle this completely. Because um, if we can just parse the text into a JavaScript uh, AST or abstract syntax tree, change all of uh, our quotes, and then code generation it back into our source. Um, and we can be confident that it will uh, still be completely valid uh, JavaScript. <coughs> copy, pake, copy paste mistake de detection. I believe this is actually already in WebStorm. Um, so let's say if I uh, copy this first line here, paste it down here, um, and I'm changing x1 to x2, but I forget to do it over here. Um, I actually, we had a pretty bad bug in WebKit uh, for one day where someone did this. It's almost exactly this, uh, this bug, um, this code example. Um, and it was a copy-paste mistake. Uh, so this can now be detected. Um, and you can be notified. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a really smart thing. 
Um, like I was talking about style guides, Code Painter is a tool that can uh, reformat the JavaScript that you're working on to fit a style guide. So if you so single quotes, double quotes, white space around arguments, things like that, Code Painter can just do the formatting for you, which I think it would dramatically change a, a lot on how people collaborate on projects um, and worry about things like style. Uh, this is Travis. Um, so Travis CI is a free hosted open source uh, continuous integration setup. So uh, this is uh, Dojo2 running inside Travis. So on every commit to this repository, Travis goes, pulls down the latest, installs a bunch of node dependencies, um, and then it connects up to Sauce Labs, which has a lot of browsers in the cloud. Um, we connect up with these browsers using Selenium, and then we execute a bunch, uh, a test suite inside all these browsers, so Firefox and Internet Explorer, um, and running our test suite just to make sure that, indeed, uh, everything passes. Um, really powerful stuff to get that immediate feedback of, um, for every single commit, how am I doing against all my platforms and all my test suites uh, with every commit and every pull request, too. Um, Right now, Travis will come back and t give you a little badge and say, I'll test passing. Um, I'm excited about other projects doing this, too, using something like the GitHub's commit status API. So for instance, um, for meeting style guidelines or uh, meeting performance goals or not making sure that, that maintainability and uh, complexity thresholds are not um, violated, uh, we can get that kind of feedback immediately. And it should all be automatic, because we as humans should not be uh, testing these things manually on every single time. Um, and we can let the tooling support this for us. Uh, so I think we have a little bit of room to grow there. So this is JIRA, um, but this is just a view of you know all the things that I just mentioned could be looked at over time, over the life cycle of a project in a continuous integration environment. Um, and the last one I have, uh, not really related, but I think it's cool. Um, so this is. Uh, Finding Layout Bugs is a CSS testing tool that can be used inside of um, uh, a continuous integration setup. It integrates very well with Maven. Um, so if you have a Java stack, it's, it's great for that. And so it does a few things. It, it detects um, some common layout bugs um, where, you, where you might have made a mistake in the CSS or might have not tested. So take, for example, detect text near or overlapping vertical edge. Um, and so what this does is it actually just uh, looks at the page, um, and uh, I think it uses Phantom JS, I believe, uh, and finds situations where text overlaps or goes right up against another element in a way that this software thinks is incorrect, and it will highlight it to you um, to hopefully be like, there might be a layout bug here. Um, so pretty cool that uh, we now have, um, this has actually been out for <laughs> about three years or so. Uh, there's yeah. Um, some of these projects have been out for a while, um, but we're seeing a little bit more adoption these days uh, of them, which I think is a really good thing. So uh, I guess that's about it for me. How are we doing, Addy? Does that's, that all make sense? Yeah. So we talked about snippets a few episodes back. Um, and they're basically a really neat way to create, edit, store, or execute JavaScript inside the dev tools. So if there are like custom utilities that you always like having available at the console or inside the tools, you can just save those as a snippet and always have them available to you whenever you restart Chrome. Now I've got some great news to share today. Um, snippets are actually moving out of experiments, and that's going to be happening sometime soon. Uh, we've also added a really neat shortcut to snippets. So if you have an existing snippet and you just want to run it without actually clicking inside the interface, there's a cool new keyboard shortcut, which is Control or Command plus Enter. So here I've got a, a snippet called grep.js by Nick DaCosta. It's a really nice utility to have. Um, it'll basically grep over different objects and, and, and find things for you. But um, I'm basically grepping over the navigator object for geo because I'm looking for the geolocation support in there. So I'm basically going to go and uh, use you know, my command enter. And as you can see, it's gone and it's run my snippet for me. I expand out and I can see, OK, well, there's the geolocation that I was looking for. It's, it's just really neat. Um, I've seen a ton of people create really useful utilities uh, and just saving them as snippets. It's great to always have access to them. Um, so just, you know, just check it out. Uh, snippets are really, really awesome. And um, 
Actually, on this same page, there's a post that I was hoping to suggest people check out um, by my colleague, uh, Paul Lewis. And it basically discusses a little bit more about those layer creation hacks and, and the null transforms and translate Zs and, and all of that stuff. It's, an, it's a really awesome post. He goes into a lot more detail about this stuff than I have. Um, but check it out. We will link you up to it later on. But uh, yeah, it's, it's really useful. Um, Paul also has a paint survey um, out at the moment where he asks developers, you know, um, do you have a paint um, bottleneck in your apps at the moment? Uh, so far, it looks like you know a lot of people think they may have a paint bottleneck, but aren't entirely sure how to diagnose those things. Uh, we're going to be looking at that stuff sometime soon, and uh, I think Paul's going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, paint cost uh, in another episode, um, but we're really eager to, to hear more from all you guys on what are your pain points when uh, identifying what is contributing to paint uh, issues both on, on mobile and on desktop um, and figuring out how we can better support you guys inside the DevTools um, with good solutions for that. So we'd love to get more of your feedback um, regarding that kind of stuff. Definitely. Anyways, thank you guys very much for watching. It's been a pleasure and we'll see you again soon.